Wonderful. So you will see that uh, the dream behind Street Store is that people who are homeless and maybe even hopeless, that we can provide them some kind of a free shopping experience. And that's why we don't want old, dirty, rubbish clothes. We want something that people can actually, people can actually wear and use. And one of the problems that we've encountered, this is a little bit funny, I can't take clothes out of my cupboard and take it to the street store. Most of them are half my size, so um, that doesn't really work. Uh, the fact is, it's happening across all of the cities that Oxido are engaged in in South Africa, and we're so blessed that we can be hope carriers in that sense. This year has been explosive for us in the Oxido story, and how God's grace is just accelerating um, in our ministries, in our campuses, and in so many places. I just want to remind you that as we are here gathering today, this will be happening in 34 different places. And some of those places, let me give you an example. There's an explosion happening in the Muat. And I always say when God can do something in the Muat, He can do it anywhere. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's really such a blessing to be a part of the uh, experience of the grace of the Lord and over the last couple of weeks, in all of these campuses, we just sat down and began to ask the question, what would it look like if the hope that is our God, in Romans, he is described as the God of hope, and may he fill you, what would it look like when people are overflowing with hope? And uh, this is the fourth discussion today. In our hope series, if you're uh, uh, joining us today or maybe last week, you're welcome to go onto the Bible app you version and go and find the link or you'll get it on our website as well. It's never too late to come and do this Bible study with us. So we have a daily study for you that you can work through if you missed some of it. And obviously everything is recorded if you want to go back to some of the sermons. I want, to, I want to take you um, to, to maybe to understand that this is not uh, the beginning of the end. It's the end of the beginning. Okay, let me, let me try that again. <laughs> what we were hoping is that the month of May will just be an introduction to a study that we want to invite you into for the rest of this year. Over the last three years, we focused on faith and on love, and this year we're going to focus on hope. And hope for us is not a, just a positive expectation of your future. That's not hope. Hope for us is a grasp and understanding of the king and his kingdom who is hope. And then our positioning towards that revelation, what it would look like if the presence and the person and the purposes of our God really becomes evident through us. My invitation this morning to you is very direct and very personal, and I want to share something of a challenge that I personally experienced uh, at the end of last year in 29 December. I just took the day. And I sensed the Lord in this year challenging me. And as I began to share this with people, the question of what happens in your firsts, the first moment of your day, what's the quality, what happens in that moment? For many of us, you know, just after I went to the loo, I opened my phone and I would go to WhatsApp and even to email and uh, jokingly, somebody once said that normally WhatsApp and email is somebody else's agenda for your life. So um, I just said, Lord, I'm not going to fill my first moment. And obviously, there's coffee involved in my first moment of the day. But that first holy moment is now filled with the content that I'm going to share with you today. I have the same question for you. What happens in the first hour of your week? What happens on the first day of every new season? What is the content? What is the uh, experience? And you will see the word behold there. It's one of the things that we know God is 
calling us to a place where we will allow the Holy Spirit through His Word to really come and reveal Jesus Christ to us. What I've discovered is if I don't put myself in a habit of the first of the day, the first of the week, and the first of the season to position myself so that I can behold, then it's not going to happen. You position yourself on a Sunday morning to come and sit and listen to the Word, and you're allowing the Word to impact. You know when, when somebody once said, there are some things that you can never unsee ever again. I want you to just think about something that you saw that you knew, I'm never going to unsee that ever again. We were on our way to an evening service in Brooklyn once, and somebody's car died in the middle of the highway, and the person got out and got run over, and I was just three or four cars behind that. That's a moment that I will never unsee ever again. Now, that's a negative moment, but I'm telling you, when you really see the king and you see the kingdom, it will change you on the inside. It will have such an impact. That's what beholding is. And, and we are encouraging and we're inviting you in a very personal way to come and position yourself this year, at least with what I've shared with you now, to position yourself in a place where you can behold, where you can allow the kingdom of God to impact you on the inside at, to such an extent that it will change the direction of your life. This is a scripture that frames this year for us. It's a prayer. It's a paradigm. It's, um, it's, it's something of a revelation. It's almost everything. We know that Jesus said we must pray, our Father is in heaven, let your kingdom come, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done as it is in heaven. And unfortunately, we know some of these verses so well they, that they end up being like a, a, a rhyme, you know, that you teach a little child and, uh, and, the, and itsy bitsy spider, uh, you know, <laughs> it falls into the same category, category sometimes. But would you for a moment, just with me, consider this question. When you pray this prayer, we were singing this morning, and I felt that when we were singing, there was just a sense of heaven in this space. You are worthy of it all. Come on, are you with me there? When we sang that, you could just sense heaven in this room. Now, my question is, when you're sitting in traffic on the N1 South, for me, whichever direction you go, or Garsfontein Road for you, um, when you're sitting in Garsfontein Road, <laughs> is that the same chorus you're singing? Because that's where my earth is. If a mom's place is at home, why do I spend so much time in my car? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. <laughs> so, where's your earth? When you go to work, when you engage people in your workspace, some of you I can see uh, are, are still in school, and, and when, you're, when you're sitting in a maths class, that's your earth. What does it mean when Jesus says, Father, as it is in heaven... Let it be, let it be here on earth. What's the expectation? What is the expectation? And I'm going to tell you that many of us, we pray this prayer with a hope that somebody else will come and do it. As it is in heaven, please, Lord, let it be in my marriage. Let it be in my home, in my workplace. But my, my understanding is that in the New Testament, God is calling us to a place where there has to be some more words at the end of that line. The implication of the New Testament is that if God's going to do it, He's not going to use angels. He's going to use you and me. And I'm asking the question today, are you putting yourself in that prayer, or are you praying as though God will send somebody else? I really know that in this year, if Dr. Leo has a dream that you will really pitch up as a carrier of hope in your home, as a carrier of hope in your workspace, as a carrier of hope in your community, wherever you engage people on this planet, then you and I need to change our expectation of that prayer. Father, as it is in heaven, let it be in my home through me. 
Come on, guys. This is challenging, and I'm asking you to come to this place with me this morning. And I'm going to give you some content. Um, for me, I, I just the sense that the God of hope wants to do something in us that will really make us carriers of hope. We are His chosen instruments. And as I look across this room, some of you are sitting here and you have a sense of influence. You feel, yes, I, I lead people or I have a big family and I've got many grandchildren, so I've got a whole legacy. Some of you sit here and you feel, you know, I've gone through such a challenging time in the in last year that if I have to be a hope carrier, John, that's a little bit difficult because I'm struggling to have hope for myself. And it's this whole spectrum of somebody who feels that you don't have any influence up to those who feel that you, you maybe have a lot of influence. But I don't see that God differentiates this, this challenge that I'm going to show you today doesn't wait for us to end up in places of influence. Actually, my understanding is that every person in this place is already a person of influence. You do not choose whether you have influence on other people. You only choose the quality of the influence that you have on other people. They are already, you are making waves. I want you to think about this. You are making waves. What is the quality of those waves that you are making? When, when you visit it with somebody and you just had a lack of braai, are they walking away with more hope? Or did you, are you one of those hope suckers? Can I use that word? Is it offensive? It was meant to be offensive. <laughs> Do you know people like that? Th those are the kinds of people that you avoid on a Saturday. Because on a Saturday, I just want to relax. I don't want to sit with somebody who's going to suck all the hope out of me. And, and, and the question comes back to me personally. So let me take you then to, um, to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 to 7, in the Afrikaans, it's verse 5 and 6. I don't know why the Afrikaners are different again. But for to us a child is born, and that takes us to Christmas, doesn't it? Actually, this whole scripture takes us to Christmas. But I think something happened for me, and everybody who works with me have heard this more than two or three times already. But I want you to listen today with a different set of ears. I don't want to talk about the scripture as though you are on the receiving end of it. I want you to consider that this is the quality of influence. This is some of the definitions of hope that people in, around you need. And if you want to be a hope carrier, this gives you some of the content of what you and I are bringing to people. And the first one is, uh, that I want to highlight is that the government is on his shoulders. Let me just take you back to 29 December when I was sitting with my laptop open, worshiping and just reading the scripture. And the Lord again said to me, John, you don't have to sit on the throne of my kingdom. I am sitting there for you. You know, that releases pressure. Last year, there was this moment of dedication where Ellen and Lihana dedicated me and my wife, Lihana, and we took up responsibility in a new phase for the leadership of Doxado. And on 29 December, that was in October, on 29 December, I surrendered that back to the Lord. And I said, Father, I will continue to recognize you are the Lord of your church. And I am just a kingdom. If you are a parent in this place, I want you to understand that God is the father of your children. I am an instrument of God's fatherhood in the lives of my children. It releases some of the pressure. If you are a business leader, I can see some of you leaders in civil society. If you are a leader of any kind... I want you this morning to come back to this place where you say, Father, I will surrender to your Lordship, and the government is on your shoulders. This place belongs to you. This business belongs to you, and I will be a faithful 
steward of what you have called me to do. It releases pressure, but now I want to take you back to when I was 16 years old, and I went on a camp um, and uh, we were praying that evening on the beach. I don't know why I remember the time. It was at 11 at night. 16-year-olds, <laughs> just uh, high school kids. We were about 40 people on that uh, retreat. It was in October of that year. And I was praying and I was looking up at the stars. And I mean, just the magic of the ocean and the beauty of that moment. And something came into my mind that rocked my world. 16 years old. I started serving God um, when I was about 13 years old. So three years later, I have a sense of the Father saying to me, in my Son, Jesus Christ, I pulled you into the Trinity. 16 years old. And something about the governance of God happened in my spirit and in my mind, where I understood what it means to be seated with Him in heavenly places. So my question to everyone in this place, when you think about God the King, can you look in the mirror and see the King that He sees in you? That's the question. It's totally silent in this place. What's happening? What's happening? If He's the Lord of Lords, then I think some of us are part of that discovery that is the Lord of Lords. That is the King of Kings. I'm asking you to come and look in the mirror because your Bible says that if you see the glory of God as in a mirror, you will be transfigured. You will be transformed into what? Into the same image. A hope carrier is somebody, in spite of all of the things that you cannot do and some of the limitations in your life, a hope carrier is somebody who knows that the governance is on his shoulder. I am a steward. I don't carry an unnecessary burden, but I've been pulled up into heavenly places. And there is authority in my words. There is authority in my presence. Yo, what's happening? Why am I not getting, I just see people staring at me. Father, I pray, I pray that people will internalize this, that you will behold your own authority in your inclusion in Christ, and that this will be a year that you will begin to understand when you pray, my Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Who's going to do that? I'm going to do that. Let your kingdom come. Who's going to do that? I'm going to do that. As an ambassador of the king in my family, in my workplace. Let your will be done. Who's going to do it? I am going to implement your will. As it is in heaven, let it be here on earth. We are the bridge. We are the bridge. As followers of Christ, we are the bridge between heaven and earth. And I'm hoping that every person in this place, in this year, will come with us to this place. The very first thing as a person carrying the authority of God on this planet that I think people are craving for is that a child was born, but a son was given. And we know that the word son there is also a term of inheritance and authority. It's somebody who then steps up uh, into a place of sonship. Can I remind you of Romans chapter 8? Uh, where it speaks about the planet, the whole of creation. And again, let's make this very personal. The whole of creation is waiting expectantly for the revelation of the sons of God. So what we are saying is the sons of God. We are the carriers of the life-giving word of Jesus Christ. You are the letter, says Paul, that people are reading. You are the one who brings the revelation of Christ. And maybe you're sitting here, and if I had to ask you, walk out this door and go uh, walk up to somebody fresh and new uh, 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 in the shopping center and begin to reveal Christ to them, 
I, I'm wondering if you know what to do. I'm wondering if you feel equipped to be that kind of a disciple maker, to bring somebody to the revelation of Christ and to facilitate somebody to see Jesus Christ and the full revelation of the Son of God. We've got so many powerful tools and so many processes and programs that can equip you to do that. I'm just asking you today to change your mindset because we're praying. We say, Father, you know, when I was small in the church that I grew up, we would pray for revival. Have anybody ever prayed for revival? Any place? What were we praying for? What were we hoping would happen if the Lord answered that prayer? And my discovery now is that revival comes when there's an acceleration of the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's where revival comes. And we are the ones who facilitate revival. We are the ones who love people into the kingdom of God. And when people come into the kingdom of God and they get excited about the king and his life and his purposes and his person, when people become excited about him, then the result is an experience of revival. Revival is the result of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whether that's in song or whether that's in ministry or word, whatever the way is, I actually want you to understand today that if you are going to be willing with us as a carrier of hope to say, Father, if it's going to be, it's up to me. If it's going to be, it's up to me. So, Father, the place that you have sent me to work. Many sit here and you say, no, I want to work in a different place. I don't want to. The Lord says, pray for the peace of the city that I have sent you to. Whether that's a holy or an unholy city is not the point. You begin to live as a called one. I am an apostolic person. I've been sent by God into this family, into this workplace, into this city, this community where I live. Wherever you go, you are a hope carrier. You are a carrier of the revelation of Christ. And I want you to, the first uh, moment of your day this year, the first moment of your week, and the first moment of every season to ask the question, Lord, what about Christ? Do you want me to reveal to people today? Obviously, it's the work of the Holy Spirit because he's the one who works in the hearts of the people. But we are Bibles walking around with the life-giving energy of the Son of God. So number one, do you see yourself seated with him in heavenly places? Number two, is the first gift that you are bringing a new, fresh understanding of who Christ is, practically knowing Jesus and knowing how to live in relationship with Him. The next thing that everybody does every single day is we are making decisions. We are making decisions. And I sat down with somebody this week again who have made disastrous decisions, and it's costing that person their life. And I asked the question, where did you get counsel for the decisions that you were making. Isn't it true that many of the disasters around decision making is when we did not have good counsel? Either we had bad counsel or we had no counsel. And unfortunately, many of us love to make the big decisions in life on our own. And I'm just asking you today, do you know that the Holy Spirit, the wonderful counselor, is in you, and he wants to counsel people through you. Do you know that when somebody tells you about a decision that they are going to make, it opens a door. I, I, I just have a question. If somebody tells you about a decision, do they then want you to stay, um, to stay out of the way, or are, are they actually sending an invitation? Now ask them permission. But a hope carrier is not just somebody who sits under a tree somewhere and is praying that God will change the lives and the quality of lives of people or the quality of what's happening in our city. A hope carrier is somebody who pitches up. And I'll give you a testimony about this. I was on the parents' board for nine years, for three seasons of the school that our children went to. And just a, a year or two later, I was sitting with the principal, the school principal, and I was in one of the core positions of influence in this principal's life for nine years. 
And I saw this, this lady talking about a new friend, somebody who follows and loves Jesus, who started rocking up in her life with this question, can I pray for you? Is there anything that I can pray for? And within two years, that person got more influence in this school principal's life than the whole parents board. And I was so surprised by what I'm sharing with you now is that somebody loved that principal enough to just rock up consistently and this person's heart opened up to godly counsel because somebody cared enough to do it. We as hope care carriers are pitching up in uh, police stations. We are pitching up in the brigadier's office of Brooklyn Police Station myself. I am pitching up, when the new mayor was elected of our city, we bought him a gift, something to eat and something to drink. And I found if you have a gift, then people allow you into their office, okay? So I took two friends with me, and we welcomed our new mayor into office. And we just said as the church, we want to tell you that we are praying for you and we love you. And our mayor in a small group acknowledged his own faith and that is part of a church. And he wants to do the God thing as long as he is in that place of influence. I'm just telling you that if you love people and you position yourself as a person of counsel, you do it with love and you say, I'll be a soundboard, then maybe we will see an acceleration of quality decisions. Hello, anybody? Quality decisions in families, quality decisions in workplaces, in civil society, because the church of Jesus Christ really is becoming, help me, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Again, it's a prayer that we pray, Lord, make us the salt of the earth, but we don't equate it back to this simple, practical activity. The next thing that really this year <laughs> has become true in our lives is that there are some things that I cannot do and some things that I cannot change. It's only the hand of God that can do it. It was one of the first testimonies about Jesus when he went to a wedding and they ran into a crisis that people could not solve. And even though Jesus felt that it's not his time yet, you know, when you talk to your mother and you say, woman, <laughs> it's not yet my time, you can sense the way that, <laughs> where are the ladies here? If your child says, woman, <laughs> you will help them to never say that again. <laughs> he wasn't yet ready, but he allowed God's power to become evident through him. And that's the next thing that I'm asking you. I'm asking you with me, just in a very personal way, I have a new revelation that God wants to do miracles through me. He wants to do miracles through me. He wants to do miracles through you. And how do miracles happen? They happen by faith. It's the only activity that releases the hand of God. The might of our God comes through faith. How does faith practically work? You just pray. You put your hands on somebody if they are sick and you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, let your will be done. And I'm asking you every single morning with my first cup of coffee, it's one of my prayers, Lord, show me today what are some of the miracles that you want to do. And I've seen miracles happen in the last couple of weeks where I just sense the energy of the God of hope in the heart of the John of hope. Hello? That's a Brooklyn joke. I see it doesn't work everywhere. Let's just, let's just go on. Okay, but may the Lord really, really, really through us come and do something powerful. I, I don't have time really to elaborate on each one of them. So this one I'm just going to skip over because last year, for a whole year, we came to the understanding of the new commandment where Jesus said the following. He says, as I have loved you, you now go and love one another. There's something about the heart of the Father that we experience in our relationships. 
Something about the heart of God comes to my life through my mother who's here with us today. Something of the heart of the father comes to my life through my dad. Something of the heart of the father comes to my life through my wife, through my children, uh, even through my bull terrier dog. There's something about the heart of God. (laughs) But let's change it around. Have you ever prayed this prayer? Lord, what about your heart? Do you want me to take to my husband or my wife today? What about your heart do you want me to take to my mom and my dad? What about your heart, Father, do you want me to take to my boss? What about your heart? Hello, Father? Do you want me to take to that political leader that I actually hoped would move to another country? There's something about carrying the hope of God that is displayed in relationships. I also believe it's the battleground of the enemy. And you will hear for the rest of this year how we talk about quality family life and we talk about relationships at work and relationships in society. And we've got a year where we are electing leaders in this country. And you will see how racial divides will be used by political leaders and people will fall into different camps. I vote for this and I vote for that. That's not the heart of our father. And as hope carriers, it's an opportunity for us. I thought I said I'm not going to say too much about this. I'm sorry. But there's a passion in my heart that God will come and do something as the Prince of Peace. Listen, guys, we live after 2020, we will live with an explosion of emotional brokenness. Every psychiatrist and psychologist that you talk to will tell you that they'd have too much work to do. Where is the church? Because we know the Prince of Peace. And you and I have a word of peace. Jesus said that I will give you peace that the world cannot give you. In economic unstable times, in what's happening in our world with wars and a lot of things that's happening, people are disturbed and distressed at a new level. I think when I went to Denmark a couple of years ago to go and visit somebody, my heart just broke that maybe 50% of the people in Denmark are 25 years and younger. I just couldn't believe my eyes. And we have a word of hope as hope carriers. Every word of encouragement that you bring to somebody releases the hope of God in our city. Every word of encouragement. So this morning you can see how this is challenging me. And I want to take you then to the last um, concept of our prayer for this year. Hope carriers, God wants to increase his influence through you this year in this city. God wants to come and facilitate change through you, wherever you go, wherever you function. Let me, let me share with you one of the desires that grew in, in my own heart personally, and it comes from the story of Joseph. Joseph gets sold out by his family He ends up in a lonely place in Potiphar's house with no privileges. If you were a slave, you did not decide what time you get up, what you eat. No privileges. And Joseph, with the heart of the steward, the one who understands that although I don't like the circumstances, God is with me. He started serving Potiphar, and he served him so well. The Bible says that Potiphar entrusted, listen to the word choice, entrusted everything except his wife to Joseph. (laughs) That's everything, okay? Everything. And then listen to this testimony. My question is, are you carrying this testimony? Potiphar An ungodly person says the following. He says, since the day, Joseph, that you arrived in my house, the favor of God has been on this house. What is the testimony in your school? What is the testimony in your business, in your industry? Is the favor of God on that place? And something in John said that, thank God for Alan and for fantastic leadership in the Doxero story. I personally want to be one of the reasons why the favor of God is on this workplace. 
It's not pressure that I put on myself. It's faith that I have. That if I work diligently and God honoring with decisions and how I behave in my workplace, the increase of his government will be in Doxodeo. The increase of his government will come through you and me as carriers of hope. And this piece of scripture ends with the, one of the biggest words in the Bible, specifically this was written in Hebrew, it's the word shalom, and shalom is not just tranquility, it's not just the increase of his governance and peace, it also means wholeness and restoration. And we are dreaming about a city, we are dreaming about families, we are dreaming about workplaces, we are dreaming about communities, where the level of wholeness and restoration will go to new levels because of you, because of you and me, and because of us collectively. If you think about Street Store, it's an opportunity to do something like that. 